how can targeted therapies really change the face of healthcare? I'd love for you to touch on uh, some examples um, from your from your own work uh, in women's health, and also uh, talking about you know the pandemic and 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 maybe some, bringing an example around COVID. Uh, personalized medicine first has been a real passion for me. I really have believed in it and have been working in it since beginning of 2000 when the Critical Path Initiative came into being. The reason it actually came into being was because of the Vioxx situation with Merck. And what happened is uh, the data didn't come forward. They kept it kind of behind the scenes. And so uh, people who perhaps had a propensity for a cardiac event actually died. It was not a good situation. The FDA said, okay, enough is enough. We need to stop thinking about drugs being this broad spectrum where you can give it to just anybody that just can't no longer be. If you have a targeted therapy, we want it to go to the right patients. How do we do that? We have to have diagnostics that help profile and stratify the drugs for the right patient. We had no idea how crazy this virus would be. Initially, we thought, okay, it's a virus, but this virus has a whole different mechanism going on. If the patient is not able, again, through its own immune system, through their own immune system, or whatever mechanism they are able to fight the virus off with and get only have mild, moderate symptoms, if they move on to a immune response, then you are in serious trouble. The problem is it, it over-engages. You know, the immune system gives off these cytokines. It goes immediately to the lung, okay, and it, and it causes, it can cause um, serious buildup of fluid. So the bottom line is you don't want that to happen if at all possible. Well, how did we find this out? We found this out by diagnostics in combination with different types of drugs. But really what we're finding now is we really need drugs that will attack and stop, stop the mechanism of the immune system over-engaging. And let's be honest, we've only known about this virus since January. Yeah. We are still learning a, a tremendous amount. How do we do that? We have to do it with diagnostics, profiling patients. You do not want to give the wrong drug to the wrong patient. And now we know we have mild, moderate COVID patients and we have severe COVID patients. And we, have to, we cannot treat those patients the same way. Yeah. And then on top of it, there's one more part of this. You have some patients who recover, no longer have the virus, they still have all the symptoms and they're called long haulers. So having said that, we need therapeutics and we need diagnostics to tell us what the story is here. And that's where personalized medicine, again, a beautiful example of how to actually stratify the patients. Personalized medicine is going to be critical in this process of figuring out the mechanisms of action that are engaged by this virus, because it's much more broad. It's not as straightforward as what one might think thinks of as influenza. The HPV is also a public health situation. You know, we had hundreds of thousands of women who died of cervical cancer in the early 1950s and the pap smear came along and it, it decreased that number dramatically, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't, the pap smear is not accurate enough, right? So this is really important. Then I went on to become the VP of Women's Health at Roche, and I was over the whole diagnostic sector of women's diagnostics. And we I had the really great honor of bringing the first HPV PCR, not the first HPV kit to market, but it was the polymerase chain reaction. Why that was important is it brought in significant uh, and improved sensitivity and specificity for HPV. Pa women who are infected with HPV, 85% of those women actually clear the virus on their own with no drugs or anything. Their own immune system actually fights the virus and gets rid of it. What we really need to concentrate on is that 15% of women who actually move from the virus, an active DNA virus, 
and it then winds into a precancer and cancer, cervical cancer. Now, having personalized medicine, we can actually say, okay, we're going to test these women who are positive for the DNA, and we're going to figure out, are those women possible candidates for it moving into a cancerous state? And we do this by using a diagnostic. You don't want to take all the women that are, that are positive for HPV DNA, or culpo or biopsy. You don't want to put them through that. It's not, those are not comfortable procedures. You're also wasting incredible healthcare dollars doing that. What you want to do is to figure out, okay, which women are really moving in that direction? And if so, yes, a culpo is, colposcopy is needed or a biopsy is needed. That's what you want to do. And that's the power of what a personalized medicine diagnostic can help with. You know, if we know that there, that we understand that the, the promise of diagnostics, what is keeping um, pharma companies, pharmaceutical manufacturers, insurers, um, you know, all different stakeholders within the healthcare world from, from really adopting this? Yes, well, I think, you know, it's like anything. Pharmaceutical companies spend a tremendous amount of money to bring a drug to market. It's in, it's a billion dollars before it's all said and done. And, you know, I know this for a fact because when I was cheering, you know, we brought a drug to market, it was $800 million. And that was, you know, we're talking in the 2000s. And so just think about that. I mean, that just takes my breath away when I say, even say the words, I can't believe how much it takes. So you can't fault pharma for wanting to recoup. I mean, they are in the business to make money and they take that money and they reinvest it in research and finding new drugs. So there's this you know, important uh, loop and important process that needs to be protected to some extent. And so in the first thing that happens is when pharma companies say, what? You're going to limit, you know, where my drug can be used, you know, is so you can start to see the conundrum, right? We want to make this a win for everybody. I mean, we want to make this a win for pharmaceutical companies. We want to make this, and most importantly, we want to make this a win for the patients because at the end of the day, if we give the wrong drug to the patients, that's not a win. This is a big challenge. How do we empower patients to start asking for diagnostics? You, you may or may not respond to the drug being prescribed to you, and you should know that. And it's right. and you know I wonder how we get that message across because we obviously don't want to create fear. And you know I, we we we're seeing that with COVID, like every yes. you know, so yeah. people just living in fear, especially those who um, you know are just either older or yes. or more vulnerable um, or who have had a loved one pass away. Uh, so, yeah, I think it would have to be really creative in terms of how do we share this message of, you know, of personalized medicine in a way that's very user friendly, very accessible. You know, the Internet has brought us great advantage in education. Right. So we can and patients have taken hold of that. They are educating themselves. They, you know, they are much more informed group than they were even a decade ago because they have access to so much information. Question is, you know, what's the quality of the information? So that's the other part of this. And you know, I'm a big believer in uh, in nonprofits that don't have a vested interest in, you know, a money interest. They are really trying to do the right thing in education. So I think patient education groups, you know, uh, you know, are paramount to doing the right things. Uh, nurses. Uh, we had great nurses who were able to answer questions. Of, they were, you know, they were available 24 uh, seven, 800 numbers to be able to access. So the patients could ask very, you know, very specific questions about their situation. Uh, I think physicians have to be educated because, you know, academic physicians are sort of on the front lines of all the new innovation. They're usually fairly versed in what's going on, you know, uh, in, in what's happened, what the kind of how a disease is moving, and they know all the kind of new drugs that are coming out. But your community physicians, that's a whole different group. And they often don't get that information. 
they're, you know, it's not that they're left out. It just takes a long time to get it to the community. So just, you've got all these academics that are working here, right? But getting that message down to the community, doctors, you're, you're, you know, like I lived in a small town, the general physician that was at the hospital or that I went to for my annual, I, you know, I was in, it lived in a town of 3000 people. How does that physician, how does yeah. he or she actually learn about this, right? That's a tough, and even with the internet, you would think that this would get, you know, easier and it has not. You would think that given the, our ability to communicate and be connected so much easier today, and yet the information is still not, the correct information is not getting to, to either the patient or the physician. And that is just, I scratch my head every day thinking about that. Um, we need internal champions, you know, within these organizations who are pushing for, you know, change and, and yes. pushing for change, but doing so, you know, with empathy and... Absolutely. And yes. Right. And, and understanding of all sides, because it's not like I want the pharmaceutical companies to lose money. I mean, I, you know, it's not like I want to come in and do that. So it's, it's a challenge. We need to be sure we can, everybody wins in this. And I think there are ways to do it. But I think that it's going to take really it takes going to take groups to come together who have thoughtful uh, people who understand all sides and are good at writing policy to help direct that. You know, I've been in this field for decades. What's really driven me is wanting to do good for patients to really bring innovation to market to make change that is good change. You know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, in the words of John Lewis, good trouble. <laughs> Make good trouble. <laughs> good trouble.